Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And in today's lesson, we are going to take a look at how hydrogen bonding affects chemical shift. So we've sort of been on a kick of doing spectroscopy lately. And this is one subject that can tend to confuse people in terms of how chemical shift, which is also known as PPM, can be affected by hydrogen bonding. So let's take a look at that today as our lesson. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually look at an example of a hydrogen bonding situation. So let's say that we have an OH bond. Now the way that this would normally be set up with electronegativity is that we would have partial negative on the oxygen and partial positive on the hydrogen. Now for hydrogen bonding to occur you need a similar bond set up and you can draw this like dotted line here and that represents the intermolecular force or the attractedness between the electronegativity of the oxygen and the electropositivity on the hydrogen here so this is our hydrogen bond that has the dots there connecting the two so what's going on here well you want to consider when we're doing HNMR uh, proton NMR for PPM that the hydrogen is what we're looking at so what's really going on with the hydrogen well first we have this covalent bond and the covalent bond between the oxygen and hydrogen is going to be moving electrons towards the oxygen right so this is the typical type of D shielding that we're used to talking about when we examine NMR spectroscopy so there's going to be a D shield of that proton but what's interesting here is that once we have the hydrogen bonding going on, we have additional pull on that hydrogen. And so when we have this intermolecular force, there is also electrons that are being pulled this way towards this oxygen. Okay, probably not as strong as the covalent bond here. However, this is still occurring. So you're getting a tug of war on both ends. And this is going to leave a severe deshielding situation on your hydrogen. So remember that when we talk about shielding and deshielding, you have your nucleus in the middle. That is where we actually look at the NMR activity and then orbiting, we're going to have the electrons. Now, as usual, this is an oversimplified model. We obviously have orbital proximity for S and P and those are all different. However, when we talk about shielding and deshielding, to deshield is to remove the shielding effects of the electron and pull it away from the nucleus. So the nucleus is more exposed to the magnetic field of the NMR. And that's what's really going on in a case like that. All right, so what's happening with hydrogen bonding is we are severely deshielding these protons. Now, what do we know about deshielding activity? Well, when we have a proton NMR, if we bring this down at zero ppm and then up here is approximately let's say 12 ppm that's about the range that we look at okay anything that's deshielded is going to be headed down this way right so this helps to explain why OH's and NH's so alcohols and amines are going to be found on the down field portion of the NMR so if this is like around six, we're talking about usually finding them in this region here, right? And we know there's other groups that are involved in hydrogen bonding, such as carboxylic acids that get pushed even further down. So they're close to the 11 to 12 ppm. And if you're confused as to what I'm talking about, you can always check out our spectroscopy course uh, that goes over the bulk of this. We also have other NMR videos that go into shielding and deshielding, chemical shift, resonance, all that kind of stuff. Um, so check those out if you're confused as to what we're talking about here. So let's consider an example. For example, if we have H2O in CDCl3, so that would be chloroform, but it's the deuterated form. So remember, we use deuterium solvents when we are dealing with your solvent of choice for NMR because we don't want the solvent peaks to overwhelm the signal of the actual compound we're interested in. Well, what happens if it's dilute? So we only put a couple of microliters of water into that sample. Well, what happens is as you have a smaller and smaller uh, solute amount, in this case water, you're going to have more and more distance between 
the water. So you're not going to be in very close proximity. And because of that, you're going to have reduced hydrogen bonding potential. Okay, so there's not going to be as great of an ability to create hydrogen bond or have intermolecular forces present between the water molecules. And as a result, we actually see a shift upfield because we are reducing the amount of hydrogen bonding. These protons are going to have better shielding going on. And it turns out that if you have a very dilute sample of water in deuterated chloroform, you're going to get a chemical shift for the water at approximately 1.5 ppm. So that's pretty low on the ppm scale there. Okay. Now what happens if it's concentrated? So you could probably guess that when we have a concentrated situation, you're going to have closer proximity between water because we are putting more water into the sample itself. So there's a higher chance that we will be able to participate in hydrogen bonding like we saw at the beginning of this video. Now, as you increase that, you're going to increase the de-shielding around the protons involved for the water molecules. So what would happen with that is the de-shielding will push the signal downfield. Remember, downfield means higher ppm, de-shielded, downfield. Keep your Ds together, de-shielded, downfield. And when you have this example with concentrated water in the deuterated chloroform, it all of a sudden spikes the ppm to 4 0.8 approximately ppm. So that's a huge difference in chemical shift. All right. Now something else we're not even talking about here is the effect of the solvent. So what would happen if instead of using the deuterated chloroform, I ended up using something like deuterated methanol, where hydrogen bonding would also be available with the solvent and not just the individual molecules of water within the solvent. In that case, you would also have changes or shifts in the PPM. So what does all of this lead to? It's going to lead to very large ranges where you can find alcohols. So if any of you have looked in your textbooks or maybe if you bought the walkthrough guide that I have on the website, you'll see that the chemical shifts on tables for alcohols and amines are going to have a very wide range. So they can get usually as low as two PPMs and then they can go all the way up to potentially 12. A lot of times the range is somewhere around two to five, but it's a very large range compared to a lot of other protons that we look at. And the reason for that is that you have to take your concentration into consideration and you also have to take your solvent into consideration. So when you're putting both of those factors together, you can create a very large range of where the uh, PPM is going to show up, where the chemical shift shows up. And even just with concentration, ignoring the solvent argument for right now, you think of it as like a sliding scale. So you start very dilute, and then if you get a little more concentrated, there's a little more hydrogen bonding. You get a little more concentrated, a little more, and you incrementally can increase. You can start moving or shifting the PPM up until the hydrogen bonding is essentially saturated all the way down to almost no hydrogen bonding or virtually no hydrogen bonding is going on because it's such a dilute solution. All right, so that is what helps to explain the effects of hydrogen bonding here on why we see the large range in chemical shift when we're talking about alcohols and amines. So one more thing here, what about carboxylic acids? Because we discussed how they're way up on the far end of the downfield ppm chemical shift spectrum right so carboxylic acids if you were to take a look at them they will very often have the ability to set up a structural situation where dimers of the carboxylic acid come together for hydrogen bonding and so what that looks like is what i'm drawing right here okay so you get a very solid and strong linking between these partners here and the hydrogen bonding activity is very difficult to break apart when you have things like carboxylic acid that can form in the optimal range to set up this activity so when you have things like this that's why you can see 11 to 12 on the ppm scale for the carboxylic acids because they can set up this type of activity where they have the dimers forming and it's much more difficult to have those sort of dissociate 
or break apart when you have the hydrogen bonding intermolecular forces going on for carboxylic acids. So because there is more or stronger hydrogen bonding activity going on in a carboxylic acid solution, it holds the downfield chemical shift to a very high degree. Sometimes it can even go past 12 ppm and you need to sort of set up special parameters in order to look at it maybe down around 13 or 15 ppm. It is possible. All right, usually most of the examples you'll see in class, they're going to show you the general rule instead of the exception to the rule. You'll see it between 11 to 12, which is pretty common. So that pretty much takes care of what we were going to discuss here. And hopefully now you have a good understanding of how hydrogen bonding can affect chemical shift. And it's very dependent on how much of the hydrogen bonding material is there, so concentration, and also the solvent that's present. Because if the solvent has hydrogen bonding capability, then you can even have a small amount of material that's hydrogen bonding or a dilute amount, and it will still have hydrogen bonding capability in solution because the solvent has the ability to hydrogen bond with it. All right, so um, just remember you can always visit the website at chemcomplete.com. We offer free resources there. We also have guides for purchase. I did create a spectroscopy guide for solving unknowns with IR, NMR, and mass spec. And anytime you buy the guides or even just visit the website, you're really helping to support the channel so we can bring you free content and education like this, because that is the way of the future. I believe that we should be using the internet uh, to disseminate this information instead of traditional classrooms, okay? Uh, remember that if you have any questions, you can always leave a comment on the video, and I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. We do offer one-on-one -on -one tutoring over at ChemComplete, so if you would like tutoring directly from me or mentoring, um, that is available if you head over to the website. And other than that, if the video was helpful, just remember to drop a like. And if you subscribe, you will be up to date throughout the semester on all of the material we try to give you guys. I do take comments and suggestions in terms of future videos. I have made videos based on user feedback. And other than that, have a great day and thanks for learning with us. And remember, we will be starting some online office hours through sort of like a live chat or a YouTube live coming up in the fall here. So stay tuned and I'll have announcements on that soon. Have a great day, guys.